Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure for me to, uh, to, to be here with you uh, today for this, uh, for this conference and really looking forward indeed to hearing uh, the, 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 the conference which will be uh, given by uh, Mr. Kaberuka. Uh, I am Erika Gerritsen. I'm uh, indeed the Director for Human Development uh, in the uh, Director General for International Partnerships in the European Commission in Brussels. Um, the European Commission uh, is, is partnering for, this, uh, for these uh, Kapuscinski lectures with uh, UNDP to organize a series of conference, conferences on sustainable uh, development. This has been taking place for many years and I'm really thrilled to know that there, are, there have been thousands of uh, students and interested participants who have been able to participate in those, uh, in those conferences uh, where, where we can think together about sustainable development and how we can work better together in this context. Of course, uh, we are here uh, today and during this week, a special week in, in New York, uh, around the, the, the UN General Assembly and all the other events and, and encounters that are taking place. And it's really a great moment for us all together uh, as government partners, institutions, civil society actors, private sector actors, to reflect on where we stand on sustainable development goals and how we can partner better uh, to, to move farther, further on this agenda and eventually, as much as possible, reach the 2030 uh, goals. As we know, only 12% of the goals have met uh, uh, so far or are on track of being met. So there's a lot of work that we need to do, a lot of thinking, and this thinking is taking place in places like this one. The European Commission remains and the European Union uh, remains fully committed to the SDG agenda to the Sustainable Development Goals, and I would like to highlight two specific uh, features of our common and, and um, current engagement on this agenda uh, to highlight to your attention. First, the EU has started and launched since 2021 the Global Gateway Strategy. The Global Gateway Strategy is our response to the uh, finding that official development assistance alone will not be able to support and make sure that the SDGs can be met. Therefore, we need to mobilize private financing, domestic financing around this, the agenda of the SDGs, around policy and priorities from uh, our partner countries around the world. And the global gateway in this endeavor is also promoting developing infrastructure. As we know that infrastructure in many different sectors is essential for uh, the development and for the creation of jobs and, and, and long-standing and sustainable development. So the Global Gateway has uh, five different uh, key uh, pillars and sectors in which we are interv uh, intervening on digitalization, obviously the green transition, connectivity, uh, health, where we are investing a lot in uh, uh, promoting, for example, the, the production of uh, vaccines and med medical products uh, in Africa. Uh, because we know that Africa has been extremely dependent on the import uh, of vaccines, for example, during the COVID crisis. And the fifth uh, pillar of the Global Gateway is around uh, research, uh, development and uh, education. Education being a, a, a key feature, obviously, and, and a key, uh, 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 if not a prerequisite for the success of any of the other uh, pillars which I have just uh, mentioned. So that's, that's what we are doing through the, through the Global Gateway and really working in, in, in strong partnership, uh, looking at the twin transition, the digital and the green transition, and working together, EU, together with our partner countries around the world on this uh, shared uh, agenda. But within this, and this is the second uh, point that I wanted to come at, uh, we know that inequalities are raising around the world. They are raising uh, in Europe and in, in, in other countries where we work with in regions. They are raising within countries and they're ra raising among countries. SDG 10 is, is an important SDG because it is indeed cross-cutting. And it cross cuts across all the, uh, all the sectors, when education, uh, health, but also access to services, digitalization, access to energy. Uh, obviously. So we are, and, 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 and my commissioner, Commissioner Urpilain, and the, the, my minister, if I can put it this way, is very committed to this inequality agenda. And we have uh, started and launched um, the use uh, of an inequality marker. So for each and every action that we as a donor, uh, we, we, uh, we have in, in, a, in a country and we, we, we finance in, in a given country, 
or at regional level or at global level, we measure and identify to which extent this initiative, this project, uh, mm, this investment is having an impact, uh, a, po a positive impact on inequalities. This inequality marker has been developed in the context of the facility that we have with the French Agency for uh, Development, which is an inequality, uh, uh, an inequality, a partnership around uh, inequality, which is producing an, a lot of um, extremely valuable research uh, uh, papers and documentation, data-based research around uh, inequality. And uh, I think that for those of you who might be interested, it's, uh, 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 it's good to look at uh, the wealth of, of documentation and research that has been done on inequality in the context of this uh, facility. So these are the two features that I wanted to highlight from the, from the European Commission's development and, and commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, agenda. There are, of course, many more. Um, but, uh, but I think that now it's uh, the time for me to, to hand over, I think, first to Jeffrey Sachs, uh, who will uh, introduce the, uh, the, the further panelists by um, Donald Cabiruga for his uh, conference. Geoffrey, Jeffrey, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Erica, thank, Erica, thank you so much, and uh, thanks to the Commission for its wonderful work uh, because uh, the European Union is one of the most important development partners, probably the most important development partner in the world. Uh, the scale and the scope of what you do is enormous and very, very important. And thanks also for partnering in the Kapuczynski Lecture Series, which we're absolutely thrilled. Uh, thank you all for being here and also the online audience around the world because we're connected all over the world through the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We're going to hear from a very remarkable person and a person with a unique experience, uh, Donald Kabaruka. I don't know if there is anyone else that has his range of experience of development finance because development finance is complex. Uh, how do you finance the SDGs or finance sustainable development? Partly through national budgets, partly through partner support, uh, partly through uh, multilateral development banks, partly through private capital markets. And uh, Donald Kabaruka has been a leader in every one of those spheres. So he has been the finance minister of his country, of Rwanda. That's a big deal because the finance minister is really the place where all of these pressures come together and where the budget is the core of achieving sustainable development. In that capacity, he led the coordination of many partner institutions because one of the difficulties of being a development partner is there are a lot of them. They're not all the scale of the European Union, but there are more than 20 bilateral donor partners and then many institutions. And many countries get completely pulled apart by this demand for this, demand for that, whereas Rwanda very distinctively said, we have a plan you support us, and that is a very clever thing to do, which he really implemented. Then he became the president of the African Development Bank. So that's Africa's multilateral development banking institution. That's a big deal, because this is the main multilateral development bank for Africa. And in that capacity, you have a continental-wide perspective and you are lending for development. Then he became chairman of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. The Global Fund is a different kind of development finance. The donors pool their funding and then a single specialized global fund makes grants for targeted, very crucial purposes, in this case to save lives from three epidemic diseases, TB, malaria, and HIV AIDS. And so this is a very special kind of funding. It's one I'm 
very much uh, uh, attached to and beloved because I helped to set it up with Kofi Annan back in 2000, 2001, launching this global fund. And it continues its extremely important work. And under uh, Donald Kabaruka, it expanded that work and that financing. And now he is a private sector investment advisor. So now he's moving private capital to the equity and loans for business investment, especially in Africa. I asked him where he's based. He said on an airplane. That is the uh, place where uh, lead investment advisors are based uh, because you're meeting clients, funders, uh, potential uh, portfolio firms, and so forth. So here we have someone that has all the experience from 360 degree perspective, from the country's perspective, from a multilateral development bank, from a global fund, and from the private sector. So I'm extremely delighted uh, that such a wonderful leader and longtime friend and in many uh, projects a colleague uh, is here to give us the Kapuczynski Development Lecture. So let me welcome uh, Donald Kabaruka to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for those kind words. I must say that uh, uh, Jeff, in setting up the Global Fund uh, and his teams, these guys are visionaries. Visionaries in a sense that in the 1990s, especially those of you who are still very young, you do not perhaps appreciate what HIV AIDS meant for almost everything. Schools were empty, doctors were dying, uh, private sector could not find a uh, skilled workforce, and HIV drugs are very expensive, very costly. But thanks to uh, what Jeff and his colleagues did, uh, now we've uh, perhaps reached the point where uh, I think I could confidently say it's a point of no return uh, on um, HIV AIDS. In fact, in many countries, we are targeting what is known as 90-90-90. So 90% of the people should know their status, and 90% of the 90 should be on drugs if they have uh, HIV, and 90% of them should be virus-free. That is an amazing development. So Jeff, I want to say this, because sometimes we have to try and translate SDGs into reality, and that is uh, one of the achievements of this, uh, I think, of this century. <coughs> now, <coughs> again, thank you for, for inviting me. As Jeff said, I come to the field of development from all of these circles you have mentioned. Uh, I began off as a finance minister of uh, a, a country with not much financial resources and with big ambitions. So we had to figure out how you fund development in those kind of uh, circumstances. And managing the donors was one of them. Oh, all right. Can you hear me now? Just to fix it up a little. Maybe this. All right. There. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Good. So I was saying that I began off as the finance minister of, uh, of my country. And uh, you know the history of my country is quite challenging. And then thereafter, I became head of the African Development Bank, so I was providing now uh, development finance. So I went from the one who you may call the recipients, that was the word, to become what they call a development button. And then as Jeff said, when I left the bank, I ended up in the Global Fund, now mobilizing global donor funding for these uh, epidemics. So I've been there from these three angles. And so what I thought I could do uh, today is just make three key points. Uh, 
and I want to focus on Africa mainly and around development finance. You know, the continent of Africa up to the year 2000 was mainly experiencing negative real per capita growth for almost 30 years. Growth was about 3% and population in some countries like the Sahel above that. So the continent was getting poor. At the same time facing the whole lot of uh, challenges, uh, epidemics and uh, uh, other disease burdens which are not epidemics by impose a high cost social and economic on the countries. And then a number of conflicts. You remember the war in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Angola, in many places. So the continent was getting poor. But around the turn of the millennium, something happened. And for the first time, we began to see real per capita growth in many countries. In fact, a word was coined wrongly in my view, called the uh, Africa Rising. Uh, perhaps a bit premature, but that was what was happening. And if you took health alone, the changes which have happened between the year 2000 and now are remarkable. The fastest decline in child mortality in human history, the fastest decline in maternal mortality, and many other indicators. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. The problem is that many of those achievements were funded externally by partners. And so what we face now is what we can call sustainability of those achievements. How do we sustain those achievements in a new global landscape where probably, probably uh, judging by what happened at the last uh, global fund replenishment, when one of the G7 countries literally uh, dropped out. Uh, it is most likely now that we'll have to figure another way of funding those kind of uh, uh, programs. Now, it's not simple about sustainability, it's more than that. Uh, when I was giving my farewell speech at the Global Fund, I said to my colleagues from the Global South that outsourcing the health of your people to the goodwill of foreign taxpayers is not a policy. It is an, an alibi for the absence of one. You simply can't do that. So the starting point is uh, developing countries will have to do a lot more for themselves. Now you may say, but this is a cry in the wilderness, but just look at what the new president of Nigeria has just done. Oil subsidies were costing the country about $10 billion per year. $10 billion. And as you know, in all these untargeted subsidies, they're inequitable and they're inefficient. They benefit mainly wealthier people with big cars and so on. Okay? But if you reduce those subsidies and you target them to those who need, the savings are huge. And if you target those savings to funding things like SDGs, uh, that could be a reflection of your own commitment uh, to your own people without necessarily increasing the tax burden. Angola is the same. Angola spends about $4 billion on oil subsidies. All right? So already, in terms of public finance management, there are many things we can do ourselves in our countries by raising more revenues, by better spending, by more equitable spending. So the starting point in funding the SDGs I want to put it to you that for the majority of countries, we'll have to do a lot more for ourselves in terms of better spend, more equitable spend. So that is a starting point. But that will not be enough, especially in countries which are characterized as fragile states or with lower uh, tax base. So the next thing then would be what? So I traveled to Vietnam uh, about two months ago in the activities of the Global Fund. And the Minister of Health said to me, they have not had a single case of malaria for two years. For two years. And I just was curious about what, what have you done? 
And when they walk with me through things they have done, remember Vietnam where it is, all right? Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, where they are, these malaria areas. For two years, not a single case of malaria, all right? And when she walked me through what they have done, it was simply around efficient spending, better spending, targeted spending on this particular program. But, but there is something else the Vietnamese have done, which Jeff, maybe you, since you're an expert in these issues, you may have to explain better than I. The GDP of Vietnam was about $14 billion in the early 1990s, 14, one, four. The GDP of Vietnam now is just below $500 billion. From 14 to $500 billion in the last few years. So I was keen to understand, A, was this a mere increase in GDP, or did it also impact the people in terms of housing, health, and education? Yes, it has. All right, but how did you actually transform the economy in such a big way? It turns out, number one, investment in education outcomes, not education inputs, education outcomes. Uh, I think there is uh, now a whole set of literature which is showing how even a small country like Vietnam could actually invest in education in a way which gives you the, the outcomes you want. Number two, energy, the invest in energy. Remember, I talk about SDGs again, uh, we have now 800 million people in the world who don't even have a bulb, 800 million people. But if you add the energy needed for production, the number has got up to 1.2 billion, right? But in Vietnam, they have invested in energy and that has helped. And what has happened there? They have been able to attract massive amount of foreign direct investment, especially from the lack of Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, all right? I don't know if some of you may be aware that each time you buy your Samsung product, the chances are one in four that it has been made in Vietnam, not in South Korea. So attracting investment. But to attract investment, you have to put the basics in place. So that is one more thing we'll have to do, how to grow the economies, but grow them more equitably, attracting investments, and then collect the revenues needed for funding development. Okay, but even then, it would not be enough. So why the conversation now around how the World Bank, uh, other international financial institutions uh, should work differently? It is because A, the model we have had since the 1960s, which is of a closed envelope, is no longer working very well. And increasingly people arguing that, I think even one of your colleagues, Jeff, has said that very powerfully, that if you look at the demographics of the world today, a large part of the global north, what you call global north, is having what you can call a glut of savings. But again, because of demographics, uh, those savings are not attracting an interesting return. Look at Japan with negative interest rates, or many other countries. So because of the demographics, there is a glut of savings, yielding very little in terms of return. But on the other hand, in the Global South, it is the opposite problem. The Global South, because of the demographics, would yield a better return, all right, if it could attract those savings. But uh, those savers in the North, or institutional investors, uh, fear things like currency risks, political risks. So someone has to pick up that risk. And there is an argument that now, if we put aside for now the issue of global public goods, which I'll come to, the best way to attract capital to low-income countries with dynamic demographics would be for some organization in between to pick up some, not all of the risks, to pick up some of that risk, and then you provide a win-win for savers in the north and for uh, countries in the south who require 
uh, to invest in education, health, energy, and so on. And so I'm hoping that in the conversation going on about the reform of financial institutions, we we'll figure out how to make them less risk averse. I laid one, I can tell you, we are very risk averse for reasons to do with uh, shareholders' preference for triple A rating and stuff. So we have to think about how to reform the international financial institutions. So rather than being simply handing over a closed envelope, how you attract savings available in the private capital markets. It does matter, even if you increase now the capital of the institutions by three, four times, it will still be small in relation to the challenge, but it will also be small in relation to what is available in the private markets. So closing that gap, closing that gap is, I think, what will enable many of us to fund the, uh, the SDGs. I don't know whether the phrase from billions to trillions is still in vogue, but we are nowhere near the billions, let alone the trillions. And the way to find the trillions uh, is in the private market. But private markets are not charities, all right? And they look at risk. They look at a country like Sudan, what's going on. Look at the size, say, look, this is too risky. So we're very, very hopeful that in the reform of the financial institutions, this matter will be given a lot of attention, that shareholders will allow these institutions to take on a bit more risk and thereby attract uh, private capital. Now, Jeff, I don't know how much time you decide to give me. Sure, 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 sure. Now, I'm not naive. I'm not naive to believe that we can achieve all these SDGs uh, at once. I'm sitting on a panel uh, on the Sahel set up by the UN Secretary General and African Union. I don't those of you familiar with that region from Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Sudan. You're talking about 100 million people. Uh, some of the highest demographics in the world, some of the uh, lowest uh, human development indicators in the world, and of course now the issues of uh, jihadists and the aftermath of the Libyan crisis. So there will be large areas of the world where things I'm telling you now, more domestic spending, attract investment, attract capital, will not be feasible in the short term. For those countries, we shall need international solidarity, which is much more vigorous than it has been in the last uh, few years. We need the lack of the European Union uh, to be a partner. You know, I, I kept saying to my friends that each time I've talked to my friends in the European space vis-a-vis -vis Africa, understandably, they are usually focusing on three things. Number one is migration, of course, migration, all right? But they forget that most of the migrants are not from Africa, actually. And they forget that actually 80% of all the Africans who cross their borders go to other African countries. They don't go to Europe, all right? But also they forget that Europe actually needs migrants. But it's an issue for them. The second, of course, would be China. I won't go there. And then the rest would be uh, to deal with uh, radicalization and terrorism, that kind of stuff. But I always remind my European friends that Europe and Africa are like twins. They are Siamese twins. And there is a way we can relate to each other in a way which addresses your social concerns, but also our economic concerns along the lines I've just described. I think it can be done. It's in the interest of Europe. It's the interest of Africa. And that's what will enable us to do some of these areas where we still need a lot of international solidarity because it may take time to attract investment to grow the economies for funding uh, the SDGs. So I thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, and let's uh, stay on this uh, big picture issue, which I think is at the core of the core of the economics of 
ending poverty and achieving sustainable development. As you said, the rich countries, the high income world, uh, is capital rich. The returns on capital are there, but they're modest, of course. The growth is uh, low, not zero, but just what new technologies allow because the uh, availability of high returns on basic investments is long, long past. And the rich countries are aging and saving for retirement, so they have excess saving. The lower income countries are younger, much more dynamic, a lot of headroom for technological upgrading by investing in infrastructure. Of course, a lot of potential for raising skill levels because education levels historically have been much less in terms of years of schooling or access to higher education. So traditionally in economic theory, we would think that the high saving of the capital rich region would flow to the higher returns of the capital poor region. And <clears throat> the example you gave of Vietnam shows that growth can be very fast indeed. And the example of the largest uh, case of this, China, shows that growth could even reach 10% per year on a sustained basis for 40 years because between 1980 and 2020, China had an average of about 10% per year growth. That means a doubling every seven years in the size of the economy, seven years to double if you grow at 10% per year. And that means more than five doublings, which is two to the fifth power, 32 times. China increased nearly 40 times mm -hmm in its GDP during this period. And by one measure, output at international prices, China's by far the largest economy in the world. By another measure, output at market prices, China's second to the United States. But all of this is to say the growth potential is very high in a capital poor country if the right investments are made. And those investments are education, health, infrastructure, and the business that thrives on that, whether it's for mining or agriculture or tourism or industry. So just to say, I've, I've been trying in recent weeks to make a simple calculation. What is the rate of return to economic development? Seems like a little bit of a naive question, but if you view a whole economy like a business, and you say this is a business that has an investment proposition. At the level of the nation, the investment proposition invest in the people, invest in the infrastructure, invest in the business. And using a standard economic model framework, you can calculate the high growth that can come from the high investments, and then you can do what would be done in a corporate investment scenario, ask what is the internal rate of return to investing in a low-income country as it becomes a high-income country. The answer is somewhere between 14 and 20% annual rate of return. That's high. You don't get that in many places. Development is a high return activity. So naturally you would say, well, all these venture capitalists should be investing in low income countries. And then they don't. So the return is high, but the flow of investment doesn't come. And then you ask the puzzle, why is that? And I think that there are a couple of answers, but one basic answer is, it's a pretty complicated investment. If you're investing in a business, it's described as, well, we're gonna build these three factories, we have these suppliers, we have these customers, and here's our market 
in the next 10 years, and this is why we have a 20% internal return over the next 15 years, and then 10% later, and therefore we can finance this deal. But with the country, it is, well, we have the education minister, and uh, she's going to be investing in children for the next 40 years, and they're gonna grow up, and they're gonna be very skilled, but that'll be 25 years from now that they're in the workforce. And we're investing in roads, rail, power, digital, and that's 15 to 20 years, but we're gonna get there, that's good. And by then, the investor says, you know, I need a five-year payoff, are you kidding? And you have to say, yeah, but development is a 40-year process, it's not a five-year process. And it seems to me that this is a fundamental issue, which is, the hard part is you have to know where to invest, and when the money flows in, it can't all be taken away. You know, the investment has to be made and well-governed. I personally believe that that absolutely can be accomplished, that that's not the biggest challenge of this story, though it sometimes is. To my mind, the biggest challenge of the story is it takes a long time, and it's complicated. And investors invest in simpler things. They want to invest in a power plant. They want to invest in a road project. They want to invest in a single thing. But you have to put together all the pieces and say, this country is a good investment prospect, or this continent is a good investment prospect. And my argument would be the returns are extremely high, but you need really patient capital. And you need to say, don't give us a seven-year euro bond, or don't ask us to pay off in 10 years. That first grader will only be in 10th grade then. They're not going to be repaying through higher taxes or through their skills in the labor market. You've got to give them 25 years. So give us long-term finance, and we will deliver the highest returns in the world, higher than investing in Google, higher than investing in Apple, higher than investing in any of these tech firms, but you have to be patient. So that would be my yeah. argument. I wonder what you think of it. Maybe I can. No, I mean, exactly to the point. Can I um, please? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I th thank you very much, Ms. Kaborga. It was really uh, extremely interesting to, to listen to you and to your presentation. Um, and uh, I, I really like the way, the way you framed also the, uh, the relationship between the European Union and, well, between Europe and Africa more, more generally. And, and indeed, I think that this long-lasting relationship is, is very dear to many people very, and very important uh, to, uh, to, to, to many of us. And we want to cherish this relationship. Um, and I, I believe indeed that, as you put it, the shared interest uh, is, is really at, at the core of, what, of the renewed um, uh, partnership between the continents, as we recognize that there are indeed, uh, 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 that there is so much potential indeed in Africa for Europeans to invest, uh, European private sector. And this is actually exactly what we are doing with this global strategy, global gateway strategy, which I was um, mentioning in my introduction, just to name two sectors in which we are particularly looking at, but, but there, are, there are many others. Well, there is, there is the energy sector and the climate, uh, well, the, 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 the energy transformation, and there was a, an important summit in, in Kenya recently on the climate um, uh, agenda, or the African climate uh, agenda, which, which I think was really interesting and where the EU showed a strong interest with our president von der Leyen, who was there. Uh, no to be to speak about hydrogen, for example, or investments, uh, etc. So a lot of potential on the, in the energy sector, a lot of uh, and which goes with it a lot of investments and potential in the critical raw material sector, which uh, of course also here needs a lot of uh, good governance uh, around how you are going to extract those, res those resources and making sure that the revenues and the wealth that is coming from this extraction is actually staying in Africa. So this here there is also very strong uh, agenda in relation to this private sector investment. Um, the pharmaceutical uh, industry, I was also mentioning uh, earlier, is, is one of these areas where we want to, or sectors in which we want to trigger exactly this investment by uh, private sector, European private sector, but not necessarily, uh, to invest in Africa, create jobs and value in Africa, and really having these value chains um, uh, built uh, along the, 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 the road and, and making, creating the wealth and, uh, again, um, 
resources and, uh, and, and maintain them in Africa. But from an economic perspective, I think it's also interesting, and you mentioned the fossil fuel subsidies from the financing viewpoint. Fossil fuel subsidies are indeed uh, still there. Uh, as we know, it's a completely regressive uh, uh, um, uh, public spending. It's not, uh, it is not contributing to reducing inequalities the contrary, even if it is sometimes complicated uh, for, for um, uh, people to understand. I think it's important to reduce those fossil fuel subsidies, making sure that the most vulnerable or those who actually cannot afford the extra prices that this would mean uh, could be uh, compensated for that in one way or another through social protection systems, uh, uh, for example. Uh, from, from, uh, the, so so in, on the financing side, I, I would say there are two things. There is the financing of the private sector, and making sure that the private sector can invest. And for that, you mentioned de-risking, and de-risking is obviously the key word because all, I mean, the 14% is not happening, why, or I mean, investment is not taking place, why? Because the risk is perceived as too high, and it's really a question of risk perception. And I, I think that more sort of anal analysis on this perceived risk would be very useful. We are for now completely dependent on credit rating agencies, private agencies, who are measuring these risks. You know, should we actually maintain such a system? Uh, and and should, be, should, be, should, be, should we really be dependent on this? And I would really like and be curious to hear your views um, on this. And then there is also the, then there is the sovereign financing. And there comes the question of debt, obviously. And we are now facing again a situation where the debt levels are becoming very high and sustainable in many, uh, in many countries. And, um, and, and, and here uh, also I would, I would be happy to hear your views on how, how do you see this uh, debt uh, situation uh, moving forward and, and unfolding. And, and another source of financing that we are not mentioning, that we, that, that we should mention more in my view is the illicit financial flows and the tax evasion. And here again, there is an untapped potential for African countries to, to really uh, make sure that uh, taxes are paid where they are due and that those revenues actually flow into the, um, into the, national, uh, into the national budgets. I will, I will leave it at that for the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I really want to agree with both of you. Uh, Jeff, issue of patient capital, I totally agree with you. And the tenure of these loans is ridiculously low. So I totally agree. I just want to add a nuance on the issue of debt. Um, and, and I want to frame it this way. So on the issue of debt, there is the composition of the debt, the speed of accumulation, and what you invest in. These things have to be taken together. My country has no problem with debt now, right? The net present value, the debt is 30%. Debt to GDP, south of 50%, so we're fine, all right? But there are a few countries where the composition of the debt, the speed of accumulation, and the things they invest in, they could have issues. But there is something else we should also see. You see, in the aftermath of all these crises we have had, rich countries had one huge advantage, which is they could print money. They could print money, they did print money. Okay, so now economic laws uh, uh, have not disappeared. If you push too much liquidity out there, one day you'll have to pull it back. Okay, now we're facing inflation. So the countries who printed money, all right, are now pushing up interest rates, all right? And those who are paying for those policies are borrowers from the global south. We have to be open about it. All right? So it's okay for rich countries to deal with the inflation, okay, but it has consequences. It has consequences for us in the global south. Um, I thought I should say that because I think there's too much confusion around the debt issue, all right? Uh, I know there are a few countries who have mismanaged the debt, and uh, that is a governance issue. But for many others, it's more the impact of these uh, synchronized, almost simultaneous shocks to the system, which have weakened the, uh, the economic fundamentals. Uh, how do you explain that a country which does everything right in policy-wise has to deal with the aftermath of the global financial crisis, 
the aftermath of Libya, the aftermath of the pandemic, all happening at once, all right? Obviously, the fiscal base will narrow. If it narrows, uh, debt will be competing with the health and education. So I thought I should say that because I think there is some self-saving narrative on debt which does not bring out the whole picture, okay? Number two, uh, on credit rating agencies. I really wonder sometimes, because during the global financial crisis, uh, this matter was discussed in the G20, right? How come they never saw Greece coming? How come they never saw all those issues in the Mediterranean region, all right? When those guys could borrow at competitive, uh, because they were seen to be less risky, all right? But was Greece probably even more risky than my own country, maybe, because the rating agencies believe African countries are risky, by definition, almost. All right? Perception. And so there is a discussion now going on about uh, what to do about it. Uh, of course, investors will always make their own assessment. Even if you say to S&P and Moody's and Fitch, get out of the way, investors will find another way of assessing the risks. So I'm more for international financial organizations to take this matter up in terms of de-risking, but also help in clarifying what are the risks which investors face. And I'm happy that this conversation is going on. I want to add also by saying this, uh, Jeff, and this on the global public goods. Because I'm just wondering, since Copenhagen, uh, who has not heard about the $100 billion per year to deal with adaptation and, and mitigation? We're still talking about it. We're still talking about it. Look at pandemics. Because COVID was a threat to everyone in the world, it became top of the agenda. But since the WHO declared that COVID is no longer a threat to public health, global health has come down in the list of priorities. But you know what? COVID has now joined HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis as a problem for the global south, all right? But it is no longer a problem for the global north, all right? So I think there is a way we have to think about these issues uh, because there is, again, another self-saving argument about no one is safe until all of us are safe, and then suddenly find you have no vaccines. I was on the African Union team during COVID, which is set up by the President of South Africa as chair of the union, even when we had money, we could not find the vaccines. Even when we had the money, we could not find the vaccines. But there are some countries, you know very well, who had purchased vaccines several times what they need. And then a couple of months before expiry, look, they ship them to, to us. So those kind of, uh, uh, I would call it unfairness. And the fairness is not strong enough. It's, it's not strong enough. When is a pandemic a threat to global health security? Only when it threatens rich countries. But if it threatens only countries in the global south, there is a matter for philanthropy, development organizations, all right? And so these are issues you have to handle. And I believe that, again, the reform of the international financial institutions on how we handle global public goods will have to be given much more attention than I fear uh, the current agenda of rich countries is giving it. If I could add, uh, jump into this discussion also, with uh, so many resonant uh, points that are important. Um, I have to say, if you just allow me to reminisce for one moment, the Global Fund uh, emerged out of my mouth in uh, July 2000 at Durban. And the reason that it did is that there was an AIDS pandemic, but in the rich countries, people were receiving drugs. And in the poor countries, not at all. Not at all. And I was flying into the International AIDS Conference in uh, Durban, South Africa, 
and I was reading an article by the World Bank. And I reached the end of the article shaking mad because the article was what the poor country should do about AIDS, but it didn't mention antiretroviral medicines as even an option for poor people. It mentioned bereavement training to help companies cope with the big losses, deaths of their workforce, but not drug treatment. So by the end of the plane ride, I handed it to my wife. I said, can you find the word antiretroviral in here? And she couldn't. And so we got off the plane. I went into my talk, and I blasted the World Bank for not doing anything and said, we can't rely on the World Bank. We need a new global fund to fight this disease. And um, it was, uh, for me, exactly the phenomenon you cited which is, it's a crisis if it's hitting us, uh, but this is part of uh, the, the reality. On the question, I would say, of debt and finance, I just wanted to add one, one thought. I don't think the African countries are over-indebted, even the ones in debt distress. The countries in debt distress have a debt maybe of 50% of GDP for gross public debt. But as you heard, Greece is probably about 140 or 150 percent of GDP. I haven't looked in the last uh, few days. Uh, Japan certainly at that level for gross debt over 200 percent, by the way, net debt a bit lower. Many, many countries with much higher debt levels but triple A ratings. One reason is that those debts are in their national currencies or in the euro in the case of European countries where the European Central Bank finances these countries. And by the way, when the European Central Bank closes off the financing like it did for Greece, then there's a massive crisis. When it turns it back on, the crisis abates so that liquidity is really a big part of the issue. The credit rating agencies don't know anything about development. I know. And they say it. They say, Professor Sachs, our job is to predict a credit event that is a non-payment on the debt. And that is true. If you're illiquid, you can be with great growth prospects, but you can't pay the debt at the moment. So if you're trying to finance a 40-year development strategy with a five-year loan, you could become illiquid after five years or 10 years because of a bad situation, because of a COVID pandemic or rising interest rates or the war in Ukraine or some other thing, and you can't roll over your credit. But it's not that you're over indebted. You're not with the liquidity. And we don't have a lender of last resort. We have a, a an intensive care unit. The difference is a lender of last resort would lend you the money up front so you don't nearly die in the meantime, but you just refinance your loan, whereas the IMF is, a is an intensive care unit. You default, you're in trouble, your chaos is broken out, and then they will give you a loan. And this is a, a big problem of the system. It was the big debate between John Maynard Keynes and, Henry, and uh, Harry Dexter White in 1945. Keynes was the brilliant economist uh, representing the debtor country, Britain, and Harry Dexter White was the uh, treasury official in the U.S. representing the creditor country, the United States. And we ended up with a creditor institution that doesn't provide a lender of last resort as opposed to John Maynard Keynes' idea of an institution that would provide a lender of last resort. My only point and advice is Africa needs a lot more debt, a lot more debt. Sounds strange. But if you grow at 10% per year, the debt doesn't look very large 40 years from now. You've had electricity, children in school, infrastructure. You're growing, booming. The debt turns out to be quite small as a share of GDP 
a few decades down the road. So we have to get away from a perspective of one year or three years or five years. And shockingly, the IMF's debt sustainability framework, just like the credit rating agencies, is a short-term framework. And I just wrote to, <laughs> wrote to the leaders of the bank and the fund, you have to revise this because it makes no sense from a development point of view. You need to look ahead, not just take a static view of the situation. So I think there are ways to reconcile all of this. I want to bring our uh, conversation to uh, an optimistic close, which is that I think the natural partnership of Africa and Europe is clear and the potential of Africa for very rapid development in the next 40 years. And I say 40 years because it's from 2023 to 2063, and 2063 will be the 100th anniversary of the or organization of African unity, the beginning of Africa as a, uh, as a unity, now the African Union. These 40 years can be absolutely as impressive as China's 40 years of development. And this is what we're counting on, and I count on this strong partnership of uh, Europe and Africa to make it possible, and on this brilliant man to help uh, make, make, uh, make the world work in this way. So let us uh, thank the European Union, let us thank uh, Donald Kavaruka, and thanks to all of you.